welcome to week three. Today we will talk about the first session, first encounter with the patient or client, setting the climate and stage. We will go back to polypsychology and the use of positive affirmations. So uh, today we will examine the client's guidelines, parameters, evaluation and expectation of the coaching relationship. Um, as we previously mentioned, this also means to understand what type of communication patterns um, we should utilize uh, the client's or patient's presence, emotions, and energy. We will also start to um, understand the OR's acronym in a much more profound way, starting by the O, which defines open-ended questions. Before we start with um, any specific approach, it's really, really important to get a client's permission when getting started. How to do that? Uh, we could start by saying things uh, such as, I would like to spend a few minutes talking about your uh, exercise pattern, your smoking, your medication, your alcohol use, your nutrition. Is that okay with you? So you really want to make sure the client is understanding that you promote a nurturing approach, you're listening to their needs, and also you uh, value what they have to bring to the conversation. Now, from the perspective of the board examination, uh, the competencies that a health coach focusing on motivation and reviewing should have is to be attentive and mindful to be open-minded, to be curious without assumptions, to pace communication to fit clients' needs and values, I should say, to listen for what is not being said, and again, this metalinguistic approach, posture, facial expressions, emotions. Use silence appropriately. Uh, one of the things with motivation interviewing that uh, especially professionals within healthcare should be very, very careful not to overemphasize is um, adding to the conversation, trying to uh, fill the void, fill the gap. Whenever we, we feel that the client is struggling, we should use signs appropriately instead of jumping ahead and answering the questions for the client instead of the client. And of course, this again has to do with addressing nonverbal communication and also making sure that we don't misinterpret the perspective that the clients just shared with us. We already examined some of the theoretical and historical differences in the development of motivation interviewing as a technique as well as a counseling style, but is there any other uh, difference between uh, health coaching and motivation interviewing? Well, a good way to answer that question is moving from a two-phase process to the concept of flow. In, in, in older coaching or counseling techniques, a session was seen as moving through two phases. In the first one, the conversation was about making the change, an emphasis on evoking and supporting change talk. The session moved then in phase two when the client was ready to make a plan. The process here is much like any behavioral counseling with a counselor or, or, or the coach guiding the client to develop a specific and achievable plan for change. If we instead are talking about motivation interviewing, instead of this two-phase process, we can think of a session moving through four fundamental processes, engaging, focusing, evoking, and planning. Certainly, uh, there is much more to motivation interviewing and another a uh, very important concept here is the understanding of basic elements of emotional responsiveness, cognitive processes, and logistic preparation to create a client-centered relationship, which is important both from a clinical standpoint, uh, from the perspective of safety, from the perspective of um, legal and professional application of motivation interviewing techniques in the context of um, health improving strategies, and many, many others very important aspects. Students should also be able to describe similarities and differences between uh, integrative health coaching as opposed to general coaching um, techniques, health and positive psychology, behavioral medicine, theories as well as evidence-based uh, peer-reviewed studies, 
techniques and strategies in general. Practicing motivation interviewing not only means to have a solid understanding of the theory and the history of this practice, but also to be able to uh, display professional, open, nurturing, supportive rapport with the client or patients. And this rapport can be further enhanced by, by um, active listening skills, verbal or nonverbal communication, metalinguistic approach, as well as meditation and mindfulness techniques, uh, very often at the intersection between uh, positive psychology, as we previously mentioned, and other psychotherapeutic techniques, for instance, uh, DBT or dialectic behavioral therapy. Now, of course, there is more. If someone is genuine, uh, this convinces the ability to be oneself and feel comfortable in the context of a professional relationship with a client. Uh, it does not necessarily change um, our clinical and professional boundaries, okay? So it doesn't imply a higher degree of self-disclosure, uh, but being present in the relationship. Um, and also, this might involve the ability to use a skill immediacy, um, which in turn means that a counselor, the health coach, conveys thoughts, feelings, and reaction in the moment, in the here and now. An example is the counselor or the, the coach sharing of their own emotions, uh, special emotions of, of, of sadness, for instance, or um, uh, disappointment in response to a client's story of a loss. So this, this grief and loss process as based upon an empathetic approach. It is definitely different from empathy per se, because empathy will convey an accurate understanding of the client's feeling of sadness. Again, we mentioned mirror neurons. In the context of immediacy, this is more about the sharing component and providing an immediate response so that we feel understood and listened to in the moment. Now, moving on to the central concept of this week's examination, motivational interviewing uh, techniques and ORs, we will talk about positive affirmations or affirmation as in the letter A, the second letter in the acronym. Affirmations are very often forgotten because we want to make sure that um, we go beyond listening for advice, as in listening to the client in order to give them our advice. The skill that is often forgotten in this context is a simple affirmation statement to a client about what they have already done or a personal strength or ability. An affirmation takes very little time, but it does require that you listen very carefully to what a client is telling you and find opportunities to acknowledge the positive aspects of your client's life. Now, this again has nothing to do or is very limited to what the client's, uh, the client's perception is to you as a coach. In other words, to what the client's limitations might be in the context of um, improving their health and adopt a more positive and nurturing um, behavior. It is more about acknowledging the positive change that might have occurred in the recent past, for instance. So the purpose of using positive affirmation statements is to build rapport, to affirm the client's past decision, skills, ability, to demonstrate empathy, uh, to affirm an exploration in the client's world, perspective, values, wishes, hopes, goals, and also to be a client's self-advocacy and ability to believe that they can be responsible for their own decision, their lives, which is really connected to the concept of internal locus of control. Motivational interviewing, of course, is much more than the acronym OARS. It's both a technique, a clinical strategy, as well as a theory of behavioral change, which means that students should master a better understanding as well as the appraisal of clients' emotions and energy. This is comprised, of course, of uh, communication skills, basic semantics, pragmatics, as well as a meta-linguistic approach such as posture, facial expressions, and the interpretation of human emotions. Of course, there are multiple acronyms within motivation interviewing, for instance, the darn cat, aside from the more standardized OARS or ORS. But beside this more theoretical consideration, uh, it's really important to stress how to engage in a appropriate flow of conversation with our patients and clients. 
Within the patient-provider relationship, the coach-client relationship, it's really, really important to maintain a professional communication level, which means that we should avoid using certain words that might be perceived as either less professional, less nurturing, or simply uh, words that don't fit the clinical context we operate in. Now again, this does not necessarily define the morals or the intrinsic ethical values of the provider, but they often are perceived to be inappropriate and they don't really foster an appropriate communication. Examples of these words could be positive affirmations such as awesome, oh that's great, oh that's cool, uh-huh, which are not the best option we have as clinicians, as providers, as coaches to again be professional in our intervention.